Let me restart. Okay, so it's my great pleasure to introduce Luca Carlon, associate professor at MIT. Um, he got his PhD from the University of Turin, uh, did a postdoc at Georgia Tech, another postdoc at MIT. Um, his work is on uh, sensing, slam, perception, and also decision making for single and multiple systems. And so he received a number of um, best paper awards. For example, for the on manifold free integration for inertial navigation, uh, and also um, for uh, um, certified, certifiably correct post path optimization. Um, I think these are some of the highlights there. Uh, and so today he's going to talk about next generation robot percent algorithms. And so I'm looking forward to this. Thank you so much, Michael. So, um, Folks, it's a true pleasure. I had a blast visiting today. Lots of cool discussions, like you know, a lot of cool uh, um, discussion and visits, like you know, overall at CMU. I'm very excited to give this presentation, and uh, I want to keep this a little bit interactive. So, if you want to jump in and ask questions as I go, like you know, feel free to to just raise your hand and ask. Okay. So, the plan for today is to tell you about the work we are doing on robot perception. I want to try to touch on three main ideas. The three main ideas are uh, hierarchical representations certifiable algorithms and the connection between certifiable algorithms and self-supervised learning. I want to start just by putting like, you know, uh, most of the faces of collaborators, students and postdocs because they are uh, uh, the ones that really are enabling the work I'm going to show to you today. So maybe a good way to start is just to set the stage and tell you about what are the motivating applications for us. These are uh, this is a slide collecting a bunch of projects we've been working on. At high level, my lab is working on 3D perception and vision-based navigation. And uh, in a nutshell, what we care about are applications which are safety critical, high integrity, and highly interactive. What do I mean with these terms? Well, examples of safety critical applications are search and rescue in autonomous vehicles. Um, if a self-driving car is failing to perceive and to do vision-based navigation, will crash and will cause uh, casualties. Uh, in search and rescue, failures of the perception of vision-based navigation system may lead the system to fail uh, looking for survivors. So these are definitely like, you know, uh, safety critical applications. We got very fun projects to work on like, you know, in these areas. Um, on the um, search and rescue side, we work on the DARPA subterranean challenge for a number of years with JPL and Caltech. So we got to deploy robots in underground environments, very challenging condition, doing uh, LiDAR-based mapping. Um, on the self-driving side of things, we've been working with Ford and with NVIDIA. So we really were lucky enough to work with the amazing partners on these challenges. So going beyond safety critical applications, we also care about uh, high integrity applications, such as the rocket and the balloon I'm showing here. So on these platforms, there is no human, right? So even if they crash, they're not going to kill people, hopefully, but they're very expensive uh, platforms, so you don't want them to crash. These are high integrity applications. And by the way, the platforms I'm showing here are something that we used. Um, one of my students was doing vision-based navigation on both platforms in collaboration with Draper. So the one on the right is the Blue Origin uh, New Shepard rocket. The other one is just a balloon. And I promise it's not the same balloon that you have seen in the news the last few weeks. So. So just, you know, make, let's make sure to clarify that. The bottom of the slide is, is uh, showing just applications which are highly interactive. This can be any sorts of interaction, can be interaction within multiple robots, interaction with the environment, such as, you know, picking objects with the flying robots and so on, as well interactions with humans or autonomy in human populated environments. So through this project, we got, got to think a little bit about the research gaps and what's missing in uh, robot perception. And I'm trying to outline the three main research dimensions that we've been pushing on and that to us are lacking. First one is robustness. We like to have algorithms which are more robust to noise, outliers, and they're also robust to changes between the training domain and the test domain. That's pretty intuitive. We care about scalability. We want perception and mapping algorithms which are scaling to very large scenes, and they also they are not requiring supervision on a specific scene. These are both very intuitive. The third one is a little bit less intuitive. We would like robots to have high level of autonomy and scene understanding. For example, for uh, low level of autonomy, I can tell the robot, robot go to position X, Y, and Z. These are like in a very low level task I'm assigning the robot. In the future, the next generation of robots should execute um, better tasks, right? So, so it should execute tasks which are more complex, such as robot, go grab me the cup of coffee on the desk, okay? 
So just to populate this, uh, this piece, you can think about SLAM as being over here. SLAM um, is a very mature technology, is uh, very robust at this point, is very scalable in the future. In the figure I'm showing an example of LiDAR-based SLAM over tens of kilometers. So like, you know, it's a very mature technology. At the same, same time, traditional SLAM is about geometric understanding, right? It's not really enabling high levels in understanding. So that's why the vertical axis is pretty short. Second data point is about 2D semantic understanding, which is the one we can afford, for example, with supervised deep learning methods. In this case, um, the robustness and scalability gets much lower just because um, robustness, you are really uh, depending on the domain shift. You cannot really generalize too well in general with supervised techniques with respect to the training domain. Uh, scene size, if you're talking about supervision in terms of pixels, you know, it's just a single image, you're not covering a very large area. But in terms of uh, quality of high level scene understanding, you are gaining a lot. Now you get semantics, you get semantic understanding. And the same applies, for example, if you use deep learning, supervised deep learning for uh, 3D object pose estimation. Now you understand objects in 3D, which is great, but the training and supervision is much more difficult. Therefore, like, you know, the approaches are much less scalable. So our ambition is to be over here, clearly. Um, the ambition is to have systems which are scalable, robust, they don't require much, much supervision, so they're self-supervised and they enable real-time scene understanding. Again, scalable, robust, and self-supervised. What I'm going to do in the rest of the talk is really telling you about uh, how we've been pushing along these three lines to enable like, you know, this vision of systems which are just better in terms of scalability, robustness, and self-supervision. During the talk, I will have three slides which are sending the high-level message. So if uh, uh, you want to pick something like, you know, from this talk, just be careful about these three slides. This is one, and uh, essentially each slide will uh, separate the different parts of my talk. The first message I want to send is that for uh, highly interactive and scalable robot perception requires metric semantic hierarchical map representations, and of course systems to build these representations in real time. So the two elements here is that we need metric semantic maps and we need them to be hierarchical. The first message I think is uh, that the metric semantic part is pretty intuitive. I do not have to insist too much on that. Uh, of course, if I want to tell my robot, robot, go grab me the cup of coffee on the desk, the robot will need some information about the geometry to avoid obstacles. We'll also understand, we need to understand the semantics. What is the cup of coffee? What is the desk? And how I get to the desk and the cup of coffee. So clearly we need metric semantic maps. So back like you know, a few years ago, we work on this uh, uh, on Chimera, which is a library for metric semantic simultaneous localization and mapping. I'm not going to go into the details of Chimera. Many of you have seen this before, but Chimera essentially is taking camera images and inertial data and is collecting all, all these images. And in real time is transforming these images into a 3D metric semantic mesh. So what you see here is a 3D mesh model. Uh, let me like, you know, restart the video. And each phase of the mesh is labeled with some color, which corresponds to the semantics of the corresponding phase. So at this point, this technology will be something very common. I think many groups will have the same technology. Something that really stands out in Chimera, I would say, besides it being metric semantic 3D reconstruction pipeline, is that we have a lot of robustness to loop closure detections and incorrect loop closures. And this connects to the second part of the talk, which is on certifiable algorithms. We also have this technique, which is called post-graph and mesh optimization, in which we can correct the map in response to loop closures. And something that really stands out in practice is that all this can be done in real time on a CPU. Okay, so you don't need GPU compute to do this. So definitely we need metric semantic maps, but why am I obsessed with hierarchical maps? I will try to spend a slide to convince you that hierarchical maps are the way to go for robotics. And to do that, I will take just an example in which you are mapping an apartment, okay, just uh, to keep it simple. And I will consider a traditional uh, non-hierarchical map, a traditional voxel-based map. Uh, so that's like a you know, voxel-based map of, uh, of the building, of the, of the apartment. And essentially what we want to do, uh, we want to have this to be a metric semantic map. Towards this goal, we have to attach semantic labels for each voxel, right? So that's straightforward. For a voxel, you would say that voxel is occupied, is a bed, it belongs to the bedroom, belongs to the apartment, belongs to a building. So we attach all the labels that apply. And we can easily realize that we'll have to do the same for all the voxels in the map. Unfortunately, that's not great. If you start thinking about the memory requirement of doing that, we realize that we have to store something that is uh, proportional of, to the number of labels. 
L, which we want to store, as well as the number of voxels, which is this quantity here. This might not seem like you know, a huge problem because right now we're doing mapping over small areas and the dictionary, I don't know, will be 20 uh, semantic classes or 100. If you think about the future, L is going to be very large. Robots are going to have a large dictionary. The English dictionary is about half a million words. So L can be as large as half a million. Okay? You already have a problem with scalability. You clearly have another problem with scalability in terms of the number of voxels. Of course, of an apartment, we can do a voxel-based map, no problem. But if you start thinking about large areas, you can do the math essentially over, a, over an area of uh, 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers, you already start having billions of voxels. So if you have to multiply billions of voxels by alpha million here, that's not something that you want to store. Uh, so essentially, I'm making a case here about uh, uh, these representations are not great for long-term autonomy and for very large-scale mapping. And we're arguing that the way to go is to just build hierarchical representations. Hierarchical representation is just reorganizing the semantic labels in a graph such that you can leverage the fact that you know, a bunch of objects are inside the same room, and a room maybe is in an apartment, the apartment is in the building. So instead of attaching to each voxel the information about the apartment, now you can just uh, group things together in terms of rooms, buildings, and so on. If you do the math, you realize that now we already broke down the complexity of storage. So the memory that is required now is the number of voxels because you are still storing a voxel-based map. But at least you do not have to multiply that by L, which is the number of semantic labels. You have to multiply, you have to sum up with respect to the number of rooms, number of buildings, and so on. So you already broke, broke down a lot of the complexity. If you're even more clever than that, you say, okay, voxel-based map, let's forget about them. What you have to do is to store a more clever representation of the free space. What we consider as a more clever representation is kind of a topological map, as well as a mesh to represent obstacles. You can replace this with anything that is more efficient than voxels. You can make this into an implicit, neural implicit representation if you want. But the basic idea is that you want a representation which doesn't scale so badly uh, to represent the geometry. So essentially, we broke down the complexity of uh, storage in terms of sunning that is the complexity of the metric map plus the number of concepts that you care about. So what I'm arguing here is that hierarchical representations scale better in terms of memory requirement. And also the second point is saying that uh, if you model this hierarchical representation as a graph, it becomes straightforward to capture relations between objects or between entities. So for example, you can add edges on the right, saying that for example, a room, uh, not totally, uh, an object is within the room, but maybe the room is next door with respect to the dining room or two objects are close to each other. Okay, so we can easily reason about relations within things. The last part, which is more subtle, is something that we formalize in papers, which is uh, hierarchical graph have low tree width. That's a little bit more technical. The tree width is a measure of complexity of graphs. Um, essentially, if you want to take the graph and do some inference over that, the tree width is the parameter that will influence how difficult it is to do inference. So if you do, you're doing probabilistic graphical models, and you're ensuring that the graph has low tree width, you're done. You can apply a bunch of algorithms, junction tree and so on, and you're done. Um, now you can say, Luca, <clears throat> listen, we have, we have it in 2023. Nobody cares about probabilistic graphical models at this point. We're all doing deep learning at this point. Uh, I want to use instead gra uh, graph neural networks instead of uh, probabilistic graphical models. In a few slides, I'm going to show you that uh, um, the same complexity and the same dependence on the tree width will show up also with the modern graph neural networks. So what I'm saying here is that the tree width is kind of a fundamental limit, cannot get around that. Um, with probabilistic graphical models, with graph neural networks, it's still good to have uh, graphs with low tree width. Okay, so this reasoning, this line of thought, pushed us to, to think and to push this representation, which is called 3D scene graphs. Um, we were among the first to push on this representation. I think the very first paper is from Iro Armeni from Stanford. Um, our representation is slightly different, but I think it's very similar in, uh, in the philosophy. The representation is uh, just a hierarchical graph in which at the bottom, there is a 3D mesh. And as you go up in the layers of the representation, <clears throat> you're abstracting the 3D mesh in terms of objects and agents, let's say humans. You're abstracting that into uh, rooms, buildings, uh, places and structure is a little bit of a weird layer. These essentially, the structures are the walls and the ceiling. The places are free space, okay? So the graph that you have over here is a graph of traversable areas in the environment. 
So why we're insisting so much like, you know, on this representation? First of all, formally, a scene graph is a direct graph where nodes represent spatial concepts and edges represent relations within concepts. The reason why we are so interested and we think that this representation has a lot of potential is listed here. So the first insight is that we already said that hierarchical representations are more scalable and amenable for fast inference. Hierarchical representations like this can definitely model relation among concepts, which we care about. Moreover, for those of you working in SLAM, you can realize that this map representation is actually unifying a lot, pretty much all the map representations we used in robotics so far. So at the bottom, there is a metric, dense metric map. Layer two, you can think about this as a landmark-based map. And layer three, you can think this, about this as a topological map. So we are unifying really all the representations out there for robotics. And more importantly, this is an actionable representation of the environment. Now that we have this representation, if the robot is able to form this representation of the environment, I can tell the robot, robot, go to the kitchen, grab me a cup of coffee on the desk, and the robot will know all the semantic concepts to do that. Of course, our work was not just to define the representation. That's the easy part, I would say. Um, our, representation, our, our work went into developing algorithms that can build this representation from sensor data. Uh, we went to a number of iterations and a number of different algorithms. This is the latest one I'm showing here, which is called Hydra. It's something that we proposed at RSS last year. So what Hydra does is starting from, uh, again, you deploy the robot in a completely unknown environment. Hydra is starting like, you know, to operate the robot moving around, is reconstructing a dense mesh model of the environment, is figuring out the trajectory of the robot, is reconstructing a map, map of objects and bounding boxes for the objects surrounding the, the robot, is extracting a traversability graph of the free space, and is also clustering the graph in terms of rooms, buildings, and so on. So it's building really the scene graph from scratch. This first part of the talk is supposed to be a little bit high level. So I will not tell you too much about the secret sauce in Hydra. I will highlight maybe like, you know, a few things here. The first thing is that in Hydra, we never need to create a monolithic voxel-based map of the entire environment, which we said before, is kind of a deal breaker. If you have to create that for a very large scale environment, that is not going to fly. With Hydra, we show that you never need to do that. Uh, the second is that uh, the object can be segmented from the mesh. That's pretty easy. And possibly if you have a CAD model of the objects, you can register them to the mesh. Um, the places, they can be extracted by computing on the fly, the generalized Voronoi diagram of the free space. So it's something that as part of the mesh reconstruction comes as a byproduct for free. So you can do this very efficiently. And for the room segmentation, essentially we, we reason over the graph of places, again, which is the graph of free space. And we do some fast community detection method as a way to cluster the places into different rooms. So um, in this slide, I'm showing a couple of things. I'm showing, first of all, a real example of uh, building the scene graph with real data. And I'm at the same time highlighting a couple of features at the bottom. So let me set, set the stage a little bit. So there is the robot uh, driving around. These are the images. Sometimes the images disappear if there are humans, just for privacy reasons. Uh, there is a semantic segmentation in 2D. And there is the scene graph here, uh, the 3D view, as well as a top view of the scene graph, which is reconstructed by Hydra. Um, what I want to show in this video is that uh, um, you can see that the robot is starting on the first floor of this building, is going up through the stairs, is going to the second floor, but you can see that the robot is drifting a lot, right? Because everything is sensor-based. There is some visual inertial odometry which is running, and essentially the estimate of the robot will drift, and that is also visible on the top view reconstruction of Hydra. What we show, we show a couple of things. We show that uh, once you have the scene graph, you can do much better place recognition. So now that you have the scene graph, you can use objects, you can use places, you can use room information to do much better job at doing loop closure detection and place recognition. And indeed what happens in the middle of this video is that the robot is going, um, is drifting, but is coming back to the original location and is able to detect a loop closure there. Not only that, we propose a framework which is called 3D Scene Graph Optimization, in which we show that by solving a single optimization problem, you can correct all the layers of the scene graph through a single optimization. So that essentially is generalizing post-graph optimization to optimize uh, metric semantic representations like this. So you see at this point, there is a snap, which is essentially the loop closure correction from our 3D Scene Graph Optimization approach. 
I have a little bit of quantitative results. I don't think that you know they're, they're important. You can look at the papers, but essentially these are saying that uh, we do a decent job at segmenting rooms, in particular on uh, on these data sets. Um, the precision that we get in segmenting the rooms is around 70% for Hydra, different variations of Hydra. Gets a little bit lower in very uh, different environments like subways. Just one second. And they compete very well with approaches which are offline. The last line is Chimera, which is a completely offline approach, which will take around 30 minutes to do the same job. So let me pause for a second. Yeah. It's a great question. I think there are multiple answers. The first answer is that uh, you can find a better network probably than what you used. And indeed, <laughs> in the most recent paper, which is the journal version of these, we are using one former, which is a newer, like, you know, segmentation works much better. There is a little bit of trade off between uh, uh, accuracy and runtime. So you have to be careful about that. The second answer is that uh, actually Chimera, uh, the construction of the mesh at the lower layer, will essentially average out information across frames to perform integration on the voxel-based map. That will average a lot of noise out. The third answer is that that kind of noise, the main effect that we see out of the segmentation noise is that small objects will disappear, while large objects are mostly in the map. So that's what we see. Um, going back to the point about how much, uh, how important is it to get right segmentation for the loop closure, we have descriptors uh, for place recognition, which are using the objects around the robot. So definitely, like, you know, if you have very poor segmentation, that can hinder the performance there. In practice, we see that uh, adding multiple layers in the descriptor for loop closure gets much better performance. So the results are encouraging in that sense. Okay, great question. And uh, um, okay, and uh, uh, here I will, I will go fast through this, but essentially uh, the main point is that, uh, there's an old video, by the way, we're doing more tests right now. I think the main point of this video is that uh, um, what I'm showing here, I think that's the, the most important part. What I'm showing here is really designed to be something lightweight <clears throat> that can run on a robot. Uh, this is an example with the A1, Unity A1. I think the most important part of this slide is the runtime on an uh, NVIDIA Xavier, which is like you know, a small embedded computer. You can process all the layers of the scene graph, objects, places, rooms in a matter of milliseconds. So everything can run, um, can run on a CPU very efficiently. I think the video keeps going, but... Uh, <clears throat> um, I think I will go to this one, which is a bit nicer. <laughs> um, so this is the type of result we get. Um, we get these 3D scene graphs. In the early version, like in the previous version, which uh, uh, before Hydra, we were able also to reconstruct the dense meshes of humans, uh, which was pretty cool. So we could also track people moving around the robot as the robot was traversing. OK, so let me move on. Um, I want to switch gear and talk about the second contribution about scene graphs, which is something that you might not uh, have heard about. Uh, the starting observation is that so far I've been showing this type of scene graphs in which we have uh, labels for the objects. Um, here we know which object we are observing. But if you look carefully, we know that there are different rooms in the environment, but we don't know if a room is a kitchen or the room is a bathroom. So we do not have labels for the rooms and we do not have a label for the building. So uh, we said, okay, can we get these labels? Of course, we don't want to train a neural network to detect a bathroom versus like, you know, a bedroom. Can we do something more clever? And the intuition is that uh, as humans, we actually can infer the room type from the objects within. Okay, so if I show you this image, there is a bed in the room, there is a chair, there is a book. Most likely you'll be able to conclude that this is a bedroom. We like to do the same inference with, uh, with a robot, okay, or with, with an algorithm. Um, this is where it gets closer to probabilistic graphical models. You could do that old style, like, you know, with probabilistic graphical models. Maybe like in a newer version is to use graph neural networks in which, uh, I instantiate a graph. For example, these are four objects with a room. I do message pass, neural message passing with graph neural networks. And then, like, you know, the neural message passing is creating embeddings for each node, and I classify those into labels. That's the way, like, you know, graph neural networks will work. What we said is we can do something a little bit more clever than this. Okay. And this led to proposing a new solution, a new architecture, which is called the neural tree. The neural tree, I think, is, uh, is, uh, I think it's nice in its simplicity. It's a very simple idea. So the idea here is that uh, you don't want to do neural message passing on the original graph. You want to convert the graph into a tree. 
So essentially, you want to do something that is called 3D composition to rearrange the nodes in the original graph into a tree structure. And you want to do message passing on the tree instead. Okay. It's that simple. You just transform the graph into a tree using 3D composition, and then you do message passing on the, on the, on the tree. Um, the thing that we see is that this neural tree has uh, pretty unique, like, you know, an interesting um, um, properties, both on the theoretical side and on the practical side. Um, by the way, let me say, like, you know, for those of you coming from probabilistic graphical models, that's not a surprise. That is the neural version of something like a junction tree algorithm, right? So that's really the insight we are coming from. So the theorem um, is going to say something like uh, the set of functions that can be produced by neural tree can approximate any distribution over a graph with the number of parameters n, that's the capital N, you can think about this as the number of weights in the graph, in, in the uh, neural network, with the number of parameters which grows linearly, this died, linearly in the small n, which is the number of nodes in the graph, and exponentially in the tree width of the graph, which is the TW of the graph. Okay. So that's why having small tree width graph is so important. Again, you can approximate any distribution over the graph with the neural tree if the graph has small tree width. Okay. The thing that will be more interesting in practice is that we see that the neural tree is implying a huge advantage uh, over baselines in practical problems. So we consider data sets for room segmentation, the Stanford 3D SYNGRAPH data set, and we measure accuracy in terms of the percentage of correctly labeled rooms. And here I'm showing the results in the table for different types of neural message passing, GCN, graph sage, graph attention networks, and so on. And I compare the results of doing message passing on the original graph versus doing message passing on the neural tree. And again, just by doing this trick of converting the graph into a tree with a performance boost, which is uh, substantial, like in some cases more than 10%. And remember that you're working with graphs with small tree width. So computationally, this is going to be fast enough, right? The traditional graph neural networks will take 46 milliseconds at runtime. The neural tree will take 65. So it's pretty much, you know, it's pretty tractable. Okay, so now, with all I've described so far, we're able to build the scene graphs, and we're also able to label the top nodes of the scene graphs being rooms, buildings, and so on. Let's look at a couple of applications of what we can do with this scene graph representation. The first thing that we can do is semantic and hierarchical path planning. So now I can tell my robot, robot, go to the kitchen and go near some table that I care about, and the robot can go there essentially and plan a path. Not only that, here we are showing that. Uh, the scene graph representations also enables hierarchical planning. So I can use the different higher uh, levels in the, in the scene graph to break down the complexity of planning and uh, drop down um, the, the time, the runtime required for planning from uh, seconds, which is what happens if you plan on the ESDF, on the voxel-based map, to a fraction of a second if you plan on the scene graph. So there is a huge potential to speed up computation. Not only that, in this kind of representation, we believe they are much more suitable to, the, to do things like, you know, task and motion planning. Um, you can do human, much better human robot interaction, visual Q&A, monitoring prediction, and so on, a bunch of things that we just started exploring. I will showcase just real quick two applications which, uh, which we um, worked on, like, you know, over uh, the last year or so. The first one is object search. So what we have been showing is that if uh, you use the scene graph, as an internal representation for uh, reinforcement learning based object search. With this internal representation, the reinforcement learning based navigation policy will generalize much better and will lead to an advantage, in this case, 10% more objects found compared to baselines which are going pixels to action. And this is an ICRA paper that we, we worked, uh, we, we uh, published last year. The second application is about multi-robot communication. Imagine that you have a robot which is building a scene graph and we want to send that information to another robot, but we do not have much bandwidth, right? So we cannot send the entire thing. We show essentially that it's easy to compress the scene graph and send a compressed representation to the other robot. Maybe like you know, the intuition is that uh, instead of telling the dense map to the robot, I can just tell that there are a couple of rooms in the environment and I can tell maybe what is the path within the rooms. But essentially, we can just send a compressed representation of the scene graph to the other robot, and we can compress the graph to a fraction of its original size while enabling the other robot to be still good navigation using it. Okay, so this is closing the first part, which is the more substantial, I think. And uh, um, before I go to the second part, let's see if there are questions. Otherwise, I will move to the second part. 
Okay, so the second part, the second message here, again, there are three messages. The second message is about uh, uh, the fact that safety critical and high integrity applications require certifiable estimation algorithms that are able to distinguish correct estimates from incorrect ones. So we want algorithms that are able to detect when they fail, and in particular, estimation algorithms. So the basic observation is that behind the cool videos and systems that I've shown in the first part of the talk, to enable this system, essentially, we are solving a number of estimation problems. Estimation problems show up when you have to solve, for example, object pose estimation from point clouds, object estimation from images, SLAM or post graph optimization. So inside the system of showing, we have to solve all these like, you know, problems. And the nice thing is that these problems typically will have a unifying formulation. So typically, they will be formulated as optimization problems. In the optimization problem, you're trying to figure out some estimate x. For example, that can be the pose of the object that you want to estimate. You are given a bunch of measurements, yi. These can be, for example, features belonging to the object that you want to estimate. And you're solving this minimization problem by minimizing a residual error, which is just a measurement of the fit, how well like, you know, the estimate is fit in the measurements. And of course, you're doing this over a large set of measurements, capital M. So, um, I'm assuming you have all taken like, you know, the course from Michael. So this is like, you know, uh, something very standard, like, you know, factor graph optimization and so on. Uh, the problem that you addressed in particular is the fact that uh, in many cases, in most cases of interest for robotics, many of the measurements will be outliers. So if you're doing object pose estimation, and you're extracting these features. Many of these features will be completely off because the detection algorithm is not working perfectly. For post-graph optimization, many of the loop closures will be off just because uh, there will be uh, false place recognition results and you will have many outliers. And um, and say, okay, look, I think people in the 80s, maybe um, 60s, solved this problem for us. They just told us that we just have to put a robust loss function, uh, raw. So instead of minimizing a quadratic function, we just have to put a robust loss function. I think what people back then didn't tell us is how to solve the resulting optimization problem. Okay. These are very tough problems to solve. Um, you can look at the state of the art in robotics and vision. In robotics, local solvers are typically the way to go. Think about gradient descent, Gauss, Newton, and so on. You start from initial guess and you go down trying to minimize the cost function. Uh, great, but in many cases, you do not have an initial guess. Right? You do have no idea about where the car is in the environment. And also, these local solvers are very easy to get stuck in local minima. And local minima typically are poor solutions, poor estimates of what you care about. People in vision will tell, well, the solution is RANSAC. RANSAC is a very popular algorithm. It's a very nice algorithm. It can be understood as a sampling-based algorithm to solve this kind of robust estimation problems. Okay. The issue with RANSAC is that uh, RANSAC will mostly work for low-dimensional problems, which have a small minimal set. So will not apply to problems like SLAM, for example. Uh, Ransack is non-deterministic, which somehow like, you know, is not great for many applications. And uh, um, Ransack will probably fail if you, have, with high probability, will fail if you have too many outliers, unless you really are uh, considering a number of iterations in the millions. Okay? So what really bothered me out of these algorithms is that really, like, you know, both local solvers and Ransack will just give you an estimate. The estimate can be completely wrong, but without notice, they will tell you, give you the estimate and the estimate, again, again, can be wrong. This really pushed us to find better ways to solve these optimization problems mm -hmm. and to think about this idea of certifiable algorithms. What is a certifiable algorithm? It's an algorithm that is able to compute a solution, so it's providing us an estimate, but it's also providing a certificate. And either, either the certificate is telling us that the solution is the best we can get or is detecting failure otherwise. Okay. So I want myself driving car uh, to either tell me, like, you know, I'm in control, I'm understanding objects, everything is fine, or to stop if the car is not understanding the objects around, around us. So um, we have spent you know, a few years thinking about how to solve these optimization problems. Very general framework. With this kind of optimization problem, you can model from object pose estimation, shape estimation, slam, and so on. It's a very general framework. Um, I will give you, like, you know, just one slide overview. We really did a lot of work in this area. Um, and I will dig in one of them uh, afterwards. So we worked on graph theoretic algorithms, which are able to reason over compatibility between measurements and use graph theory to filter out gross outliers. 
We work on algorithms which are uh, based on uh, graduated non-convexity, which are, are just producing empirically much better solutions for this problem. And then we worked on uh, um, the certification part, which is about how do we distinguish if we got the optimal solution or not. So that's the last part in this plot is using this idea of uh, moment relaxations and semi-definite moment relaxations. I'm going to touch on that in a few slides. It's a little bit more mathematically deep, but I think it's, uh, um, there's such general techniques that I think it's important that you guys see them uh, if you're curious. Before entering into the, those mathematical details, I just want to tell you that actually these algorithms, despite the theoretical properties I'm going to discuss, they work extremely well in practice. Many of you might have seen or used Teaser++, which is an algorithm for point cloud registration. This is robust to 95% random outliers, is running in real time, and is also open source. At RSS, um, uh, I think a couple of years ago, we also pro proposed the extension of that which is space, which is estimating both the pose and the shape of the object we care about. And it's robust to 70 to 90% random outliers while the state of the art was breaking at 50%. And finally, for post graph optimization, uh, through the use of graduated non-convexity, uh, right now as part of GTSM, we have uh, algorithms which are robust to 70, 90% of outliers. And uh, um, these algorithms have been included in MATLAB at this point. So they're pretty like, you know, standard algorithms. Yeah, so this is the part in which there is a little bit of math. Uh, if uh, uh, you don't want to hear about it, you, you can close your eyes for a second. But trust me, trust me, like you know, the tools I'm going to describe are so general that even if you're working on something completely different, you might find a way to use this stuff. And I'm going to try to simplify this to the maximum possible extent, uh, which is going to be embarrassing because I see Fravresh in the audience. So it's going to uh, one of the, the really top experts on, on this kind of things and like, you know, robust statistics and so on. But I'm trying to trivialize some of these things for you just to tell you like, you know, um, um, to show you that these are very simple tools actually. There's nothing like, you know, beyond the math, like, you know, they're very intuitive tools. So the starting point here is that we want to solve some problem like that. It's a robust estimation problem with some robust loss function, residual error, and we want to estimate the X, right? So the first insight that we have is that for a large, uh, a large set of problems in the form one, so as, as the one that I'm showing here, showing up in, in uh, perception, in robot perception, can be formulated as polynomial optimization problems. What is a polynomial optimization problem? Something extremely simple. It's just an optimization problem in which both the objective and the constraints are polynomials. Okay? So P, H, G are just real polynomials in some variables. Okay. So how do we show that uh, this is true? Well, we just take a bunch of problems we care about and we manipulate the math in a form of this, uh, there is a polynomial optimization problem. We have done that for many problems in robotics. So we show that uh, the statement about uh, this problem being easy to convert into a polynomial optimization is true for uh, single rotation averaging, multiple rotation averaging, which is what is used in structure promotion. Postgraph optimization is LAM, point cloud registration, blah, blah, blah. It's a long list of problems, okay? So just to give you the flavor, it's very easy to do that. So for point cloud registration, you pick the problem, you go to the literature and you see that the, the point cloud registration can be solved using this problem. So essentially in point cloud registration, you try to match a set of points PI with a set of points QI, and you want to compute a rotation and translation, which is aligning the two point clouds. But if you look mathematically at this object, this is a quadratic cost function in RNT. So it's a polynomial, it's a quadratic polynomial. And if you look carefully, like, you know, this constraint SO3 is not immediate, but if you work out the math, SO3 is something that you can write in terms of quadratic polynomials as well. So both the objective and constraints are just polynomials here. Not only that, we also show that if you replace the squared loss function with, uh, uh, with a robust loss function, rho, you still retain that properties for uh, a large set of robust loss functions. So here I'm showing the seven for which we show that, you know, this holds true. But essentially, if you choose these cost loss functions being, uh, I don't know, from the Uber loss to the truncated least squares lost, uh, you still get a polynomial optimization problem at the end. Nothing too fancy. I think the way you show this is that uh, uh, you take the, for example, the truncated least squares, you write it down, and in particular, the truncated least squares we are writing cleverly by using a binary variable, which is deciding the transition between the quadratic region and the constant region. And I would just have a problem with an extra variable, which is the theta. So this before was a quadratic polynomial, now it's a cubic polynomial. Nothing changes really. 
come. So it's really that simple. And by the way, through a tool in computer vision, which is called Black Ragaran and Duality, we can do this conversion between robust loss functions and uh, problems with this theta for all the other cost functions as well. So hopefully I convince you that you know, we can formulate a lot of things we care about as polynomial optimization problems. The downside is that uh, we haven't solved much. <laughs> because unfortunately, polynomial optimization problems are such a general class of problems that it's still NPR to solve. It's still very difficult to solve in general. You can formulate binary optimization as a polynomial optimization problems. So you can really solve a lot of problems with that. So we haven't solved much. The POP are still hard to solve. The good news here is that uh, the second insight is that the POP emits a very systematic way to go from the polynomial optimization problem to a convex relaxation, to a simpler problem, using a tool which is called the Lasser hierarchy of moment relaxations. Okay. So how many of you have heard about Lasser hierarchy of convex relaxations? <laughs> okay, yeah, very common, like, you know, very expected. I think in robotics, this is not, has not been very common. I think there are very few papers in vision doing that, and they're like, you know, uh, from a from while, while ago. Might be useful for you to know about this. It, this is actually pretty popular in control instead. So in perception, it's not very common, but in control, it's been used a lot. Um, let me tell you what this is about. Um, so you, you have a polynomial optimization problem, and you want to relax this into something that is convex, meaning that something that is fast to solve. For the example, I just consider a problem with uh, two variables and with polynomials of degree four, just for the sake of the, ex the example. So what Lasser is telling you that you have to do, the first thing that you have to do is to build a monomial basis. Monomial basis, you can think about this as a vector with monomials of degree zero. So that's the one, degree one, which is x1 and x2, and degree two. So x1 square, x12, x2 square. So you just have to collect a bunch of monomials from this. Um, and then you have to take to compute the moment matrix, which is the vector of monomials multiplied by itself. So it's just a larger matrix, which is containing all these monomials. And now the monomials will go up to degree four, right? Because you are multiplying two things which are up to degree two. Okay. So this will contain all the monomials up to degree four. Therefore, there is a very simple intuition here. If this contains all the monomials up to degree four, I can write any polynomial up to degree four as a linear combination of the entries of this matrix, right? Because this contains all the monomials I care about. By taking a linear combination, I can form any polynomial I want up to degree four. So if uh, I can form linearly, like you know, if I can write any polynomial of up to degree four as a linear combination of the moment matrix, essentially I can write uh, both P, H, and G as linear functions. So in this case, the objective will become just a linear function of the, of the moment matrix. And the linear constraints will become just a linear function of, uh, of the moment matrix. Uh, there is a catch here. The catch is that uh, the moment matrix is supposed to be a rank one matrix. Um, and the rank one uh, constraint is non-convex. So Lasser is telling you, you have to relax. You have to drop that constraint and you get a convex relaxation. You can still enforce that the matrix is positive semi-definite, which, which it is for a definition. And also in the recipe, there is also a way to add extra constraints to make, to make this relaxation better. So, so far, just, uh, just as a summary, with Lasser, uh, we're able to go from a polynomial optimization problem into a semi-definite program. The first one is very hard to solve. The second one can be solved in polynomial time. So essentially, we gain tractability. Now we can throw algorithms at this and solve it globally. Um, the thing that is impressive out of this work, of course, is work from Lasser more than, than what we did, are the theoretical guarantees that come with it. Uh, theoretical guarantees are in the theorem. I will just extract a bunch of points from these, which are the important bits. The first important bit is that if you solve the moment relaxation, again, that can be solved in polynomial time, you get the matrix X. If this matrix is rank one, it means that uh, from that matrix, you can extract an exact solution to the original problem. So in other words, if you solve this problem, like you know, the easy problem, and you get the rank one solution, then it means you can solve also the original problem exactly. Okay, that's great. The second message here is that uh, uh, if you consider enough monomials, so if you scale the size of the X and up, the relaxation will always be exact. Okay, so you will always eventually get rank one solutions. Okay, so these are the general properties of the Lasser hierarchy. What they're making, what is making them very compelling for robotics is an empirical observation, which is that the, in our problems, the perception problem I was describing, 
the relaxation is commonly tight, meaning that will produce rank one solutions. At the lowest relaxation rank, relaxation order, meaning for small matrices X, and will remain tight even if you do some trick to make the X even smaller. Okay, so you can do a lot of tricks. You can make this ma matrix X small enough, but this will still produce rank one solutions that can be mapped back to optimal solutions of the original problem. So the conclusion here is that for the first time, we can solve robust estimation problems arising, arising a robot perception to optimality, or you can use the same machinery to just uh, take an existing solution and certify whether it's optimal or not. And we can do this in polynomial time. So um, this is just to show a couple of you know, few results about uh, just to support this claim of empirical tightness. Um, in the paper, we have like you know, six or seven applications. These are just three of them single rotation averaging, multiple rotation averaging, and point cloud registration. The first plot is showing the suboptimality. So if this is close to zero, it means that the relaxation is actually getting an optimal solution. And you can look just at stride, which is our solver. So you can look just at the blue box. And you can see the blue box is always achieving a suboptimality of 10 to the minus 10 or so. So V numerically is producing optimal solutions. Yep. Um, the second plot is just showing the estimation errors, you know, rotation errors. And this is telling that optimal solutions will map to very robust estimates with low errors. Okay, I will not go into the details, but that's pretty clear. Um, and that is true for uh, single rotation averaging and for a bunch of other problems. I really wanted to cover this part because it's, it's something I'm really passionate about, which is uh, even if the relaxation is not, uh, is not exact, what kind of performance guarantees can you get on the estimate produced by the relaxation? I've done some work on that based on something that is called sum of sparse proofs. I will not have time, unfortunately, to do that. If you're curious about that, you can ask Pravesh, which is world expert on these topics. We'll give definitely like, you know, a better talk than me on this topic. But uh, uh, if you're curious about these things, sum of sparse proofs are something that hasn't been used at all in robotics. I think this is probably the first paper in robotics doing that. There is a lot of potential to, to extend these tools and to, to use them in robotics and vision. Okay, in the last five minutes or so, I want to touch on uh, the last part of the talk, um, just because by contract, I should mention learning at some point. So let me let me speak a little bit about self-supervised learning here. Uh, this is more recent, like, you know, ongoing work. So I'm going to spend like, you know, a uh, few slides on it. I'm happy to get your feedback as well. The point I want to make here is that uh, certification and self-supervision are twin challenges. Meaning that if you can certify correctness of an estimate, then we can learn without supervision. Okay, yeah, so let me give a little bit of context. So far, I told you that uh, we have great algorithms to do estimation, such as given a bunch of measurements, for example, key points, we can run our optimization algorithms, I get an estimate, right? Um, the truth is that these key points, most typically, if you use modern stuff, like, you know, they're produced by a neural network, right? So the neural network is trained to predict the wheels of the car, the mirror, and so on. So there is some training happening uh, for the neural network to predict the right features. What we're asking here is, can we enable some feedback loop? Okay. In other words, can we use, can we self-supervise the neural network doing key point detection in this case, using the math that we develop, the certifiable algorithms that we develop for, uh, for the estimation part? Uh, the intuition is straightforward. I will tell you, like, you know, the intuition with the, uh, just a couple of slides. So imagine that uh, I'm starting with a network. The network can be trained in simulation, for example. So it's a network that is not great, it's trained in simulation, and I'm testing it on real data. So for example, here I have a batch of three images, you know, real data. Um, I can try to execute this. I can extract the key points with the neural network. I can run my estimation algorithm to produce an estimate. The network is not great. So in some cases, we'll get the results right. In some cases, we'll get it wrong. But if I'm able to certify the quality, if I'm able to say this is correct and these are wrong, I can use these essentially to backpropagate information and to improve my neural network. This is something that's called self-training. Okay, and these are called pseudo-labels typically. And you can repeat this process with another batch. With the other batch, maybe I get two results right and can backpropagate through them again. And eventually like, you know, the network gets better and better. And, uh, and uh, we'll be able to classify all of them, at least empirically. Okay. The cool thing is that all these, the way we do it in the paper, is just uh, in a single training round. So in other words, we have uh, um, stochastic gradient descent. At each iteration, we pick the batch. 
we decide which solutions are certifiable and we back propagate through those. So essentially we do this iteration I was showing in the slides as different iteration of SGD. Okay. So this with a single uh, training, we'll figure out essentially we'll uh, learn from real data without need for supervision on real data. Okay, so um, the idea here, this is the architecture, the architecture uh, imaginative of some input data, uh, typically is RGBD. That's what you are playing with, either point clouds or RGBD. We have the neural network M1, which is what we want to train or uh, self-supervised train. There is the robust corrector, which is whatever optimization module you want to use to compute an estimate. And there is some uh, um, module which is uh, pro providing a binary certificate. They are deciding essentially whether the solution is correct or not. And um, we actually show in the paper that you, know, you can generalize this. You can put multiple models in parallel. You can put two neural networks, repeat the same architecture, and have them self-train in parallel. Okay? That's why we call this an ensemble self-supervised learning architecture. Um, Lots of details, but here the point is that first of all, the certificates, they're not based on the same definite program I was showing before. They're a little bit uh, more heuristics or more complicated if you want, because we want to rely on the dense geometry of the point clouds. So essentially the certificates are uh, evaluating the fit between the estimate and the input data. And uh, the cost function for self supervision will look uh, something like this, in which OC is the binary certificate that's either zero or one. Whenever this is zero, there is no supervision. Whenever we produce an estimate which is uh, uh, certifiable, which makes this one, essentially you can enable a loss function, which is uh, using the pose estimate as self-supervision for both M1 in this case and for the other branches, okay? So I think beyond the math, I think the, the plot that you should have in mind is this one. We get a network which is starting at iteration zero with a very poor performance. It's running training simulation and we are running this on real data. So at the beginning, the real data is this point cloud in, in green and the estimate is off. But as we run more and more of these self-training iterations, the estimate will get better and better quantitatively and eventually we'll get uh, very good results. The results are pretty often like, you know, as good as supervised, fully supervised pipelines. So um, I think this is the last slide I have probably on the technical side. Um, quantitative results at the top left, results from uh, YCB video objects. This is the other score. Without entering into the details, you would like this curve to be at the top left of this plot. Um, many lines on this plot, but essentially the proposed approach is the one in blue at the top left. We're pretty close to baselines, which are fully supervised, which is great. So we don't necessarily want to do better than those. We just want to match those as much as we can. And if you look at uh, one of the approaches we test against, like you know, self-supervised approaches we test again, which is self 60 plus um, plus, it's in this case, like you know, we have some gap in performance. The plot is showing an average over 16 or so objects in the data set. I think there is a breakdown, like, you know, both here and in the paper, but the message, if you look at the single objects, is pretty similar. And uh, on the right, you see just qualitative results. These are the input point clouds for three objects. These are the results of the ensemble algorithm that we provide. And these are the results from the supervised baseline. So the baselines will have supervision on real data. We don't. Okay. We still get like, you know, a little bit better performance in some cases. I think that's a good time to, to, to conclude. In summary, these are the three messages of this talk. Um, we wanted to push the performance in terms of scalability, uh, robustness, and level of autonomy. And uh, we pushed on three main messages. The first one is that for the future of robot perception, we need metric, semantic, and hierarchical map representations, as well as algorithms to build them. The second is about uh, safety critical applications requiring certifiable algorithms that are able to distinguish correct estimates from incorrect ones. And the last message is that if you're able to distinguish correct estimates from incorrect ones, you can use that for self-supervision. Okay? So you can connect to learning and, uh, and do much better uh, job at learning without requiring human uh, labels. This work, of course, was supported by a number of sponsors. I'm giving credits to them for supporting this work and I'm thanking you for your attention and I'll be happy to take questions. Yeah. Um, excellent talk. Um, I, I have two questions about the hierarchy multiplayer. So I think, like, I have no argument against uh, the hierarchy multiplayer. I think that's the best of the best. 
I guess I'm wondering what your thoughts are between these types of implicit versus explicit. I get that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I, th I think these are not uh, competing um, competing things. Um, so if you look at this representation, and that's the way like you know we are trying to write it in the in the journal version of this paper, there is a metric aspect to it, and there is a symbolic or semantic aspect to it. Everything that is at the top is more like you know semantic in nature. Everything that is at the bottom is more metric in nature. Um, so the point is that uh, we chose to represent free space and, ma and uh, obstacles as a mesh and a topological map, you can choose differently. Like you can have an implicit representation model in the free space of obstacles, but you still need to put something hierarchical on top of that to make sure that the dependence in terms of the number of labels is better than just doing like, you know, naive flat representations. So I don't, see, I don't see a conflict there. I think there is an opportunity and definitely you can do probably much better than what you're doing. Like, you know, the mesh reconstruction for us is okay. It's not perfect. So there is an opportunity there. Uh, we are looking in that direction as well. You guys might have seen this uh, nerf slam paper that we have in which we are doing more uh, um, neural radiance field, like in real time with slam. There is also a clear trade off. We can run these in real time on a CPU for running nerf slam. My students need like in a workstation under the desk with a camera. So, so there is a computational cost to pay for that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. It's a good question. Like, you know, first of all, it might be a waste not to use the negative data, but we do not have clarity about how to use that in the sense that uh, it's not really binary classification, right? You want to estimate a continuous quantity. So if you have something that is slightly off, I don't know if we can use that very well, to be honest. Um, uh, so negative examples, I'm not sure. There is definitely a problem if uh, you bootstrap and nothing works at the first time. So I'm not proving anything mathematical about this. Empirically, we see that uh, the trend goes up, uh, but you cannot prove, at least we are not able to prove that. Um, there is a knob you can play with in the sense that the notion of certification is evaluating the fit between the estimate and the input data. You have a parameter to say how well you want the fit to be. So if nothing works, you can relax that a little bit and you can be more permissive until something works. And yeah, then you can try to bootstrap and maybe uh, tighten up the, the knob as you go. We thought about that, we haven't tried it. I don't know if that will work out. By the way, like, you know, full disclosure for those of you who are uh, familiar with learning, like, you know, what I'm talking like, you know, the last part is something called self-training in, uh, in uh, neural networks, something pretty common. There are the most common um, approach for that is something that's called uh, teacher-student network. There are two networks and so on that, uh, for which one is producing the pseudo labels and the other one is learning. I think the cool thing about what I'm talking about here is that uh, you don't need two networks. You can do just SGD, a bunch of iterations of SGD, and you're learning on the fly for that. So, so there is a broader literature on self, self training for uh, neural networks. Yep. Okay, so, so the question, I guess, is uh, whether the relaxation is including extra error. And I think that's something very subtle, but it's exactly the point of what I'm saying. So the relaxations we are designing and for which we got lucky in designing them are relaxation that produces the exact solution. No, we cannot claim they produce the exact solution in all cases, that's not possible, it's an NPR problem. But empirically for like, all the problems you care about, empirically it's very tough to find worst case instances in which the relaxation is not exact. So you don't lose anything. You, you relax the problem into a convex one and you still get the exact solution. There is no loss there. Um, and the relaxation essentially, most of the cases will tell you, I solved the convex problem, I got the optimal solution, that's great. In some cases will tell you, I was not able to find the, the optimal solution, but I can guarantee that this solution is suboptimal by some amount. So we still tell you something about how good or bad is the, is the suboptimal estimate. Does, does it make sense? Okay.
Yeah, I wish the answer was yes, but uh, there is uh, uh, <laughs> there is still a difference between polynomial time and real time for robotics, unfortunately. So um, let, let me give like you know just uh, to to avoid misrepresenting things here. Um, what's going on? Um, so these are the different algorithms that we propose. Different classes of algorithms. These are running in milliseconds. This is real time, like you know, very robust in practice. These are what are getting you the performance guarantees. These are running in seconds or minutes. They are not real time. So that's the price you pay. Uh, and that's why, like, you know, unfortunately, we cannot just drop everything and just solve this because this will, will not scale very well. Um, Hank has been uh, working in my group for a while on these topics. He's now going to be faculty at Harvard. Did excellent work in trying to understand, to combine both methods. He's essentially doing a local solve using this stuff. And where you get stuck in local minima is trying to use this to escape local minima. So there is some opportunity in that direction, but but that's the short answer. Like you know, so there is still a computational uh, barrier in which uh, these things are running in seconds, and you like milliseconds instead. Yeah. Can you give a description behind the when when you do when you like in other cases like you can get yeah, I get the question a lot. I don't know if I have a good answer. Like, you know, I think there, there are fundamental limits, clearly. Um, maybe I have the results, like, you know, at some point. Um, there are fundamental limits in which uh, if you start having extreme amount of outliers, or more precisely, you have very few in layers, the relaxation will start breaking. That's what we see empirically. There are some cases that, uh, that also are like, you know, difficult to explain, right? In this case, at 40% outlier, the relaxation here is breaking. Yeah, so it's tough to say. It's, it's, I'm not able to characterize what are the worst case instances. I can understand that, you know, worst case instances will be something with uh, very extreme amount of outliers and very extreme amount of noise, but I don't think that's the entire story. Maybe Pravesh would have a better answer for that, by the way. Um, but, but um, yeah. Yeah, so it's coming like you know from a bunch of ways. The robust loss function, the residual error R is also non-convex in many cases, um, and um, it's not not common. Like you know, let, let me take that back. Like you know, the R in many cases is fine. The constraints are bad. Like you know, SO three is uh, I said that there are quadratic constraints. There are quadratic equality constraints which are non-convex. Yep. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So, I'm wondering that the video put up all the books you have. Uh, if you are trying to bring up the screen, I'm going to give the word space and uh, by the this is a different of the camera for it, only some different uh, objects in the space. So, the new site complies the location of the object in the world in the world space, or, or for example, how to guarantee that uh, uh, it is not achieved uh, in that case. In that case. So I think the question is how clever you should be about placement of objects or placement of the camera to make sure you can reconstruct a good map. Yeah, yeah. yeah so I, I think the, let me start by saying, I think there is an opportunity there. Uh, look, the opportunity is about thinking about things like act, active slam in which are more clever about the way you explore. I think right now we're not, uh, the, the assets in Unity that, uh, you know, the map, we're, we're not modifying that for sure. Uh, the trick that we are doing to get a decent map is uh, this one, right? Rotating the robot around, making sure that you know, it sees enough things. So, so we are doing like you know the active perception part manually with teleoperation, and we are sure that you know the robot is seeing enough of the room, enough of the objects, and so on. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll so currently, uh, I think that you're doing that for the robot uh, and and if I use the hydro, I can match that the I'm wondering that. Uh, for local path planning, I mean, for local path planning, 
Um, so one answer would be that uh, um, the graph of places that will show up here will allow you to do a lot of planning, but it's more like you know global planning as you're seeing. So at some point there will be the graph showing up here, and uh, the graph is essentially is a traversability graph. You can do global planning on that. Um, but local planning and local obstacle avoidance, you can partially use the mesh, but probably like, you know, since a lot of things is RGB, a lot of these things are RGBD based and use just the point cloud from the RGBD camera. So I don't think there is much specific to local obstacle avoidance here, uh, but at least we haven't thought about that. Yeah, so the, the, the point we're trying to make in the paper is that the representation, in particular the one at the lowest layer, depends on the task that the robot has to do. In principle, we don't need the mesh. Like, you know, the graph of places represent traversability. You can forget about the mesh. The mesh is purely for visualization here. Um, so it depends on your task. Like, you know, if the task maybe is manipulation, you want to have the mesh because it will allow better manipulation. Um, if you want to replace the mesh with something else, um, I was arguing it's not clever to replace that with voxel-based maps for large scale. I can make probably the same argument with point cloud-based maps, right? You don't want to have millions of points around. Um, the mesh is just a way to filter out noise and put the resolution where you need, right? For the mesh, if I have to model this uh, ground floor, I would put just a you know, few triangles. If I had to model like, you know, an object, I would put many, many triangles. So it gives you a little bit more flexibility in uh, putting the resolution where you need it. Um, so that's the advantage I see with respect to point clouds. Ah, I think you are first. I would guess that maybe certification in this sense, the way we're thinking about it is a bit less than uncertainty quantification because it will give you a binary answer, right? With uncertainty quantification, if you can uh, capture maybe multimodal distributions, you can be way more expressive than what, what, uh, what we are. I'm guessing that's much harder problem to do with performance guarantees. So that's the way I think about it. They are related problems, but the uncertainty quantification try to do even more than what you're doing. That's my take. I mean, you know, we haven't thought too carefully, like you know, about the differences, uh, but that is my take. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there is a clear difference. Like you know, ICP is kind of a local method. You start from an initial guess, and you use all the points to fit the point cloud. But if you initialize ICP in a bad way. ICP will convert to a poor solution. Teaser does not take an initial guess, right? You extract features, you align them in a very robust way. In practice, what we do for many problems, for example, LiDAR-based LAM, we try to use both. We try to use Teaser as an initialization, an initialization, and an ICP to do a local refinement. So for example, for our LiDAR SLAM pipelines, that's what we do for loop closure detection. We have two point clouds. We do feature extraction, Teaser, refine with ICP, and pass to SLAM for loop closures. Yes, def definitely. Yeah, because ICP, if you have no idea about where the point clouds are, ICP will not work. That's the short, short answer. Is a, is a good, you know, is something that will produce an estimate of the relative pose within the point clouds without needing an initial guess. The reason why we still use the ICP for refinement is that teaser will work on a number of features, right? You extract key points from the point cloud, let's say like you know, thousands of features from the point cloud and then you align them. ICP will use millions of points from the point cloud, right? So ICP locally will be a little bit more accurate. Um, let me try like, you know, um, there's a lot, there's a lot in what I'm saying. So let me try to unpack this a little bit. Yeah. So. You see, as this one, like you know, there are features that you have to extract, 
and the same like you know for point cloud registration there are features that you first have to extract from the point cloud and then you pass to teaser right and teaser will produce the best estimate given these features but these features are as a subset of points of the point cloud so they carry a little bit less information at the original point cloud that's why like you know you can be happy with the teaser estimate or you can refine it a little bit with icp so Um, they are standard, like, you, know, you can use uh, uh, things like FPFH, I was talking over, over lunch with, with uh, uh, somebody like, you know, about that. Um, so there are standard algorithms for feature detection, or there are the more modern variants, which are learning based. So essentially, like you know, the feature de detection, I think we provide as part of the library, but it's not something we work on, it's something very standard at this point. One, one quick question. Yeah. <laughs> Tough one at the end. <laughs> as it's great idea so so with hang i think part of uh, uh one of the last things we tried like you know before we graduated was to essentially learn how to solve like you know learn some structure from these sdps to solve them faster and we're using something like you know graph neural networks to learn on like you know small problems and try to generalize to larger ones. We're learning like you know things like dual certificates or something like that uh, didn't work out too well, to be honest. So and uh, maybe we didn't try much, you know we didn't try very hard. Uh, there might be an opportunity there, but you know we didn't see a huge advantage there. Uh, it's it's a great idea. Mm -hmm. I see. I see. I see. Might be a good idea. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't thought about this, like, you know, because now uh, we were thinking more about, you know, I have a bunch of training examples of SDP and we learn at runtime, but you're thinking about something more temporal, like, you know, over time we get better and better. Um, I think it's a good idea. I don't know, like, you know, I haven't thought about this, but uh, anything, I think there is a huge gap here um, uh, on, on the SDP solver side, there is a huge gap. I think if you can get the runtime of the SDP solve to be something compatible with robotics, this is something like, you know, this really general purpose we can use. And something that is worth mentioning is that, uh, um, something I was happy to see is that there is a parallel line of work in robust statistics looking at these problems so it's kind of a cool problem, not right now only robotics, but also in applied mathematics. So it's just a good time like, you know, to work on these things. Okay. Thank you.